Otherwise, what you're going to do is introduce all these compounds into your body while you still don't really know what you're doing. Like you want to have your routine maximized. You want to know what you're doing in the gym. You want to know all this stuff. Really focus on getting the most that you can out of that routine. And then if you're going to go this route, do it after all that stuff has happened. Anabolic steroids. I know some people will just be furious that I'm even talking about this today, but there are misconceptions on both sides of the conversation. And so today we're gonna have a conversation about the risks involved and break it down. What are they really? Some people say you will die immediately if you take anything. Others say that you can take anything that you want and live forever. The truth, of course, somewhere in the middle. So we're gonna break that down plus a whole lot more. This is episode 254 of The Drop Set. Let's hit it. Welcome everybody, this is episode 254 of The Drop Set. If you are watching on YouTube, hello, thank you. If you're listening out there in podcast audio only land, hello to you as well. For the YouTube audience, um, this is a little bit different from the other videos that you'll see on this channel. Longer form, less edited um, on anywhere from one to three topics per episode. So this, this particular episode will be a little bit different and this is the main topic that we are going to discuss today, what I talked about in the teaser there. So you can follow me on Instagram at The Drop Set Podcast and I would love to hear from people through there. So uh, we will have a segment today, some listener Q&A like we did last time around. Last time, previous episode, I think 252, we did that last. And... Uh, we, uh, I, I'd love to get, uh, messages from people, um, on that Instagram account again at the drop set podcast. I will keep spewing that out until people follow me there, uh, and, uh, leave a message. Um, you can, you can type a message. You can leave a video message. You can leave an audio message and we'll play those here. So, um, you can also call in 865-518-6569, leave a message there. And I'd be happy to play those on here as well, which we will, uh, we will do today. So. What is inside episode 254, April 26th, the day of airing here? Well, more listener Q&A, which is always a good thing. I love hearing that. I love getting questions from all y'all out there just because that is my way to keep my finger on the pulse of what people actually care about, the kind of stuff that you want more of in this show. Let me know. And then we are just going to dive straight into the truth about steroid risks. That's what we're talking about today. So let's go into it here. Um, first of all, a disclaimer, a very important disclaimer. This may be obvious, but um, I think it's just worth mentioning up front. I am not a doctor. I do not play one on TV. I did not stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night either. So take everything that you will hear here as a grain of salt. I'm not advocating for steroid use in any way. Um, talk to your doctor, talk to your coach, et cetera. There, there, it's worth a, an additional comment here. I have received, um, when I've talked about this in the past, I have never received as much negative feedback on podcast episodes as when I talk about this, um, to which I would say to everybody out there who has negative thoughts about the discussion of this, get over it because it happens and it's when you don't talk about it that people make stupid decisions. And so burying this kind of stuff, burying this information, refusing to talk about it creates a bigger problem. What we want to do is educate get the information out there. Here's the thing. People are going to use this shit, whether I talk about it or not. So if anything, what I think doing an epi a podcast segment like this is going to do is give some people pause who might be thinking about it and be like, Ooh, I don't know. I don't know if I like the sound of that. So, you know, I'm not, that's not really my goal either to dissuade people from using it. My goal is if you're going to use it, make a more informed decision. So honestly, any hate that you have, bring it. I don't care. Um, I am going to talk about this. Um, and if you have a problem with that, that, that is your problem. And I would want you to rethink that. Is more education in the world really a bad thing? You know, I don't, I personally don't think so. So uh, save it save it. Um, we should talk about TRT versus steroid use. How do I define this? So TRT, um, testosterone replacement therapy, the cousin to this being HRT, hormone replacement therapy, similar, although HRT is not just testosterone. This could be for women, estrogen, progesterone, etc. We're going to label TRT as anything that's prescribed, physician monitored, and at a maximum of 200 milligrams per week in men or seven and a half milligrams per week in women. Those would be, I would think, like the upper range of TRT doses. Even 200 is fairly aggressive. Um, everyone is going to be a little bit different on this. The, the thing to keep in mind here 
is that much with everything else that's related to bodybuilding, related to your dietary intake, your training volume, et cetera, everybody's different. Everybody's going to have different ranges where they need to be. The difference with this is that this is some uh, something that we can do that is actually like it's got an observable, quantifiable output that we can measure and then make decisions based upon through lab work as well. So we're going to call TRT something in this range. Specifically, it's prescribed. You're using... Um, pharmaceutical provided compounds. Notice that I didn't say farm grade, um, which is something that is, I, I think that label is bullshit, honestly, just because there's so much stuff out there that's fake that looks like it comes from a real pharmacy. It might even say Merck on it or something like that. That stuff is fake all the time. So people say like, oh, I have farm grade test. Well, did you get it from a pharmacy? Because if you didn't, it's probably not farm grade. So I'm saying pharmacy obtained compounds. Um, steroid use, we are going to define as anything that's not that. So if you're taking a dose that's higher than that, if you are, um, honestly, if you are prescribed TRT, but you've decided that you're going to use an underground product instead, because it's cheaper than what you get through the pharmacy, that's a decision that people can make. I'm going to categorize that as steroid use as well, because at that point you're off label, you're off script. Um, maybe not by a lot, but you have introduced unknowns into the mix. You've introduced additional variables into the mix. So TRT, testosterone replacement therapy, let's talk about this. Keep in mind that a lot of doctors, including hormone specialists at clinics, note the bold and the all caps there on the PowerPoint, they do not all have great ideas about how to do this correctly. I've seen many, many stupid, stupid, stupid protocols coming from physicians at, a, at HRT clinics. Um, this would be things like automatically prescribing AIs or aromatase inhibitors without there being a demonstrated need, um, women being overprescribed just because doctors don't know how to handle testosterone in women. They're like, oh, yeah, sure, that's a thing. Cool. Let's do 25 milligrams per week. Well, that's half of a gender reassignment dose. You're going to have virilizing side effects as a woman running 25 milligrams per week. It's ridiculous. It's asinine. You don't do that. The only reason for a prescription like that coming from a doctor is very simple they don't know. It's ignorance. That's it. There have been studies done on this, dose-dependent studies on women looking at two and a half, five, seven and a half, 10, 15, 20, 25 milligram per week doses, what that does to your serum testosterone levels, and then it's been reported what kind of impacts that have as far as the things that women want to avoid, virilizing effects, deepening of the voice, hair loss, uh, everything else. So that goes with that as well. So um, definitely there are some bad ideas out there when it comes to TRT in women. Now prescribed TRT, the thing to keep in mind here is that there are risks that still apply just because it's physician prescribed. Yeah, have you ever seen a medication or a commercial for a medication on, on TV that did not come with a laundry list of side effects that took the voiceover artist 30 seconds to get through. Same thing applies with all this stuff as well. Any prescribed me medication carries risks. I would say with TRT, it's probably going to be, the risks are probably going to be a little bit higher than if you're taking, say, like Zyrtec or something like that, right? So just think like, oh, it's physician prescribed. It's safe. Eh, is it? I mean, we're going to talk about this and we're going to dig into ways that you can know if it's safe for you. And if you see things happening, here's the thing. And this is something that does not exist in this PowerPoint, but it's worth mentioning right up front. Nobody is going to take a shot of testosterone or any other steroid and drop dead. That's just not how it works. Uh, the impacts are longer lasting. They're much more systemic in nature. Uh, it is something that it, it's a much more complex solution. Um, it's not like you can do a drug overdose like you can with heroin or something like that and you just die the next day or anything. No, no. Um, exceptions there could be with like diuretics. We'll talk about that as well. Those, or insulin. Those are things that can cause acute problems. Um, but steroids, anabolic androgenic steroids, AAS, do not operate that way. Um, they act much slower on the body. And what we're concerned about are cumulative effects over time, especially ones that go unmonitored and unaddressed. That's the concern here. One other thing that also did not make its way into the PowerPoint here, and I'll address that now, is the possibility of infection um, with an injection that goes wrong. And I would say, I, I, hate to, I hate to say this and issue this as a challenge, but 
to get an infection um, through through an intramuscular or subcutaneous injection, like you kind of have to be trying a little bit. Um, you have to have pretty careless injection technique. It's pretty easy to avoid. The risk isn't zero, but through proper sterilization techniques, it's it's pretty easy to mitigate those risks. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't. That's not something that I would say is like oh we got to talk about that too. It's like eh, it, it's pretty avoidable. So. Keep in mind, prescribed TRT, just because it's official and prescribed doesn't mean there is zero risk involved. The responsibility falls on you, the hypothetical you that I'm pointing at here, the user, um, to take the appropriate steps to ensure that everything that we need to monitor all falls within what I would describe as your accepted risk parameters. So everybody has a level of risk. Think about when you talk to your financial advisor, how aggressively do you want to invest this money? What is your risk profile? Well, with steroid use, it's the same thing. What is your risk profile? Uh, somebody who wants to compete as a professional bodybuilder at a high level is going to have a different risk profile than somebody who wants to get lean for the beach for the summer. You know, uh, that professional bodybuilder is probably willing to take on additional risks, push things a little bit more aggressively, live a little bit more dangerously, kind of exist outside the boundaries a little bit of what might be considered normal for certain stretches of time. And certainly some people, um, I would put like Rich Pion in this category, just absolutely do not give a shit. Uh, you know, he was quoted as saying, whatever it is, like, at least I'll die pretty or something like that, which I would say is a pretty reckless approach. I don't think I'm really breaking any news to say that. Um, and also like, think about the people around you. <laughs> it's not just you. Don't be a selfish fucking prick. Think about the other people in your orbit as well. So it's not just your accepted risk parameters, but what risk parameters are you forcing those around you to accept as well? So food for thought consider. Um, so let, let's dig into some of the things here that can, can, um, come into various levels of dysfunction. Some of these are bigger issues than others. Some of them, and that also like which ones of these things might be big issues for you. Um, there can be some individual response on that as well. Like you might say like, Oh, that's not super important to me. Oh yes, that's a problem. Some things are universally bigger issues. So, um, something like estrogen imbalance. So this is something that is largely temporary and fixable as long as you know, what to look for and uh, what actions to take if you fall into this category. So it's worth noting that testosterone and other comp compounds, but testosterone is the one that is primarily known for this. Um, they can convert to estrogen through a process that's known as aromatization. So it converts to E2. There are four forms of estrogen in the body. E2 is estradiol. That's the one that in men especially is the most potent one. E1, E3, E4, much less important for women. Those have different aspects. A lot of them are about fertility, pregnancy, etc. cetera. Um, so aromatization is something that is not a good thing. You do not want your testosterone to aromatize. What might happen here if you're going to monitor your blood work would be uh, you inject testosterone, the level is too high and that excess testosterone will convert or aromatize into estrogen. And then your estrogen increases at a rate higher than what keeps it in balance with testosterone. So it's worth noting that a lot of things on lab work, like they give you reference ranges where things should be. If you have super physiological levels of testosterone, meaning like outside what would be considered the norm, which you know, depending on the lab that you're looking at might be like 300 to 700 nanograms per deciliter or something like that. And th this is for men, obviously. For women, it's going to give you a range of like 5 to 20 as being where you want to be, which for bodybuilding purposes is way too low. Um, and so your estrogen, it's going to give you a range where you want that between like 15 and 40 uh, picograms per mil, I believe is, if I'm remembering correctly, the, the uh, units for estrogen in the U.S., of course. When we're looking at international labs, all of these units are different. All the numbers are different. So um, I'm going to speak strictly in American terms, you know, U.S. bias, right? Here we go. Now... If your testosterone is at super physiological levels, and let's say you're at 1,500 nanograms per deciliter, and your estrogen is high, it's out of spec, it's 75 picograms per mil, that in and of itself is not a problem. One of those is super physiological. The other one can be as well. If they're in proportion to one another, that might be just fine. Um, you, you don't want to look at, just like we don't use just the scale to determine how we're doing as far as progress is concerned, you don't look at just the lab reports. The other issue with checking estrogen on lab reports is that the standard estrogen test can get very confused when there's exogenous 
external testosterone being brought into the system. So testosterone that aromatizes, um, it may aromatize into a less potent form of estrogen, E1, E3, which is, is fine. That doesn't create an issue, but it can cross report as E2 and show that as being elevated. And so it might be like, oh my God, my estrogen's at 150. Yeah, well, how do you feel? Do you have high estrogen, estrogen symptoms? Do you have libido issues? Do you have um, erectile performance issues? Those are the main things that I would look for for high estrogen in men. Um, that could be an issue. Do you have gyno flare-ups, et cetera? If it's an estrogen dominant um, gyno pattern, then yes, that could be a problem. But the number itself doesn't matter. So I would always play to the symptomology of this more than anything else. And uh, you can, if you do get labs checked, um, you need to get an ultra high sensitivity estrogen test done because that will give you a number that is actually reliable. So anytime you're on TRT or you're taking any kind of anabolics, you want to check your estrogen numbers. A standard estrogen panel is worthless. Do not rely on that. Instead, rely exclusively on your symptomology. Um, or if you can get an ultra high sensitivity estrogen test, great. Keep in mind that if those numbers are out of spec, though, that can, you know, that can be okay. The symptomology is still the thing that we want to play to for the most part. So um, excess estrogen, again, gynecomastia, libido issues, erectile performance issues, water retention, elevated blood pressure, all of those things. Uh, it's bad news. We don't want that. But similarly, you might say then, well, let's just take an aromatase inhibitor all the time. But if your estrogen is overly suppressed, it can also result in a lot of those same issues, excess fatigue as well. So um, estrogen is also very, very good for the body <laughs> in proper amounts. It's organ protective, it's neuroprotective, it's cardioprotective, it's good for your health. I've talked about this in a very recent episode as well, um, more in depth. But uh, it, it's, it's super critical. So I've, I've worked with people before who will just absolutely nuke their estrogen down to nothing. And that is not where you want to be. You want to have your estrogen at a good level. Um, so uh, just keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Don't – that this goes back to the previous um, uh, slide about uh, – doctors just auto prescribing AIs. It's like, if there's a demonstrated need for it, take one. But also like, if there's a demonstrated need for it, reduce your dose, because you're just, you're taking in more testosterone than your body can really handle. So just drop it down, drop it down, avoid the AI. And the AI is not something that you want to be running long term for as long as you're running TRT. So do not default to using an AI, which is an aromatase inhibitor, something like Arimidex, Aromacin, or a CIRM, Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulator. The difference here, if you want to think about it in kind of layman's terms, is if your testosterone is aromatizing, converting to estrogen, the AI will inhibit that, hence aromatase inhibitor. Um, so it acts on the aromatase enzyme to kind of tamp down that aromatization process so that you can take in more testosterone and not have it convert to estrogen. It does not necessarily reduce your total estrogen. It's not acting like that. A CIRM would do that. This is something like Nolvidex, Tamoxifen, same thing. Um, there are others, uh, Riloxifene um, also is an, a newer one. So uh, these will actually act on your non-aromatizing testosterone or the aromatizing testosterone or estrogen rather, uh, and bring it down. So this will be a, a reduce in your estrogen level. So do you need to stop the conversion of excess, uh, uh, testosterone to estrogen, or do you have a, a base estrogen level that's too high and it needs to come down? That would be a CIRM. The previous would be an AI. So, um, and this says exactly that. So, um, CIRMs that, that can reduce your estrogen if you know what is causing an excess. Um, so this would be something where, uh, if you're trying to, um, deal with a gynecomastia flare up, for example, a CIRM is what you would want. If that gynecomastia is brought about by excess estrogen, it could be brought about by excess prolactin as well. And you would need blood work to know for sure. Um, so a lot of clinics prescribe these by default when there is no need, which is dumb. You don't want to take stuff, you know, you always want to keep things as simple as possible. <laughs> don't take shit. You don't need. Um, it's like, why would you take ibuprofen if you don't have a headache? It's like, just don't take what you need and don't take it as a prophylactic. You know, this is not something that does not carry a cost associated with it. It's not a huge cost, but it does provide wear and tear on the body. It is toxic, it, neuro and cardio toxic as well in small amounts, but still the, the steroid itself is the same. It is also cardio and neurotoxic. Why throw in another compound that makes that problem worse if you don't need it? 
Um, so they also suppress estrogen way too much, which is not good. And um, the AI is typically going to have some negative impacts as well, like we talked about. Um, so let's talk about the things that we want to monitor here. Um, the first thing and the most important realistically is being your heart and your lipid panel. So this is, in fact, the big one. Um, what uh, pretty much all steroids will suppress HDL, which is your good cholesterol, and increase your LDL and your triglycerides, which increases the likelihood of some kind of cardiac event. So um, a rec regular lipid panels are an absolute must. This is like the most basic level of, of thing. It's super easy. Go and get a lipid panel checked and monitor this over time. Um, certain compounds are going to influence this more than others. And also keep in mind, there are genetic factors here. There are men and women out there that can run an absolute shit ton of anabolics and not really have it skew their lipids at all. Um, or sometimes like your default lipids are so good. Like I've seen clients where their HDL is higher than their LDL, which is like, that's a sign to me, like the only way you're going to die is if you get hit by a bus or something like that, if, if your lipid panel looks that great. And so maybe introducing a crap ton of gear will skew those a little bit so you look more like a normal person, <laughs> right? So, oh, your HDL is in a normal range instead of being super high. Super high is great. HDL is cardioprotective. Um, and your LDL is up a bit, but it's still like, you know, well under what we would consider to be a problem zone. So um, genetic factors um, and, and personal uh, variables uh, factor into this tremendously as well, as they will with everything. So cardiac hypertrophy, enlarging of the heart is also a risk. So an EKG is a very simple test. Both an EKG and an echocardiogram are simple tests. Um, the EKG just monitors electrical function in the heart. It's a little minimal. Um, it will identify arrhythmias, things like that. An echocardiogram provides a visual of the heart, which, you know, for a steroid user is something that's much more important. You want to monitor that over time and just see if things are, are increasing in size. Um, you know, left ventricular hypertrophy is the primary cause here. And people say like, oh, big heart, great. Heart's a muscle that's bigger, right? No, a, a larger heart is a less efficient, less effective heart. That is not what you want. So um, these are fairly easy tests to do. Um, they are not difficult. They're not intrusive or invasive. They just require you to actually schedule it and do it. It, which is the biggest barrier for a lot of people. Um, erythrocytosis um, is another thing. If you have elevated hematocrit and hemoglobin levels, that's HCT and HGB, um, this is a problem. This leads to an increased risk of a blood clot, stroke, pulmonary embolism, all that kind of stuff. None of that's good, uh, clearly. Have you ever heard those words uttered in a good context? No. If you're hearing those words, we're talking about bad stuff. So um, the hematocrit and hemoglobin levels, those are easily determined through... Um, through a CBC panel, complete blood count. Those are two of many tests that are reported in a CBC. Um, and they're, they're likely going to be elevated if you're taking anabolics. Uh, the question is, are they going to be elevated into a range of concern? So that's the thing to watch for here. Other things can also cause um, issues with those. So um, if those two are elevated, it's, it's likely due to your anabolics. If you have a blood panel that's really, really skewed, some things are high, some things are low, this could be related to anemia or other things like that. There could be other conditions that can cause skewing here. But if you see like, oh, my hemoglobin, my hemoglobin, my hematocrit are elevated, like uh, this is why. <laughs> if, if you're on gear, this would be why. So um, kidney issues is another thing. So um, uh, steroids, they place additional stress on the kidneys and they can cause direct kidney damage or lead to an increase increase in blood pressure because the kidney cannot regulate your the kidneys cannot regulate your blood pressure um, as efficiently as we would like them to. So the kidneys are the, the organ that are primarily responsible for regulating blood pressure. Um, and blood pressure, it's, it, you can easily monitor that at home. And what I say here in the slide is it is the single most telling indicator of a problem in the body, just because so many things can manifest themselves and demonstrate as elevated blood pressure. And just because it's so easy to check, like check it at home on a, get a blood pressure cuff. If you're a big dude, get a cuff that like an oversized cuff, just because if you have a big arm and a, uh, and a small cuff, like you can make it fit, but the numbers might be skewed a little bit. So 
uh, but a, a lot of dysfunction in the body will show as elevated blood pressure. Um, the standard for like ideal blood pressure would be like 120 over 80. If it's a little lower than that. That's great. When you start getting a little higher than that, that becomes problematic. Just keep in mind, um, when you do check your blood pressure at home, uh, do it when you first wake up, get some fluids in your system first so that you're properly hydrated. Otherwise the numbers will be skewed and just keep in mind a lot of other factors can influence this as well. Um, I went to the doctor a while back and they checked my blood pressure in there. Um, and it was elevated just because I was nervous about being in the doctor. So it was like 145 over 90 or something like that. And he's like, Whoa, what's going on here? I'm like, eh, I don't want to be here. <laughs> That's what's going on. <laughs> and, uh, so I, and I monitor at home. So I knew that that was irregular and I went back home, checked it the next morning and it was like 122 over 76 or something like that. So that can change acutely just based on, you know, anxiety levels, stress, et cetera, as well. So, um, liver issues, oral steroids in particular, um, they're 17 alpha alkylated and they, uh, they are, uh, processed that way. I'm not going to get into the chemistry of it um, as far as what that looks like because, full disclosure, I do not know. I, I know the words. I don't know what the chemical structure looks like because it doesn't matter. This comes down to the, like, there's this discussion that I always like to say if somebody, you know, if you want to demonstrate that you know something about computers, like, do you need to know how to operate a computer? Do you need to know how to build a computer? Or do you need to understand the science behind how a printed circuit board works? It's like, I, that, Understanding how a printed circuit board works is irrelevant for teaching people how to use a computer or how to build one. doesn't matter. Same thing like un having an understanding of organic chemistry is irrelevant for <laughs> being able to teach people on this. I, don't, I, I took chemistry in college. Do I remember much of it? No. Um, so if I look at a molecular diagram of something, do it, does that make much sense to me? No, it absolutely does not. So point being something has changed and I think it's a, I think it's a, one of the bonds between carbon atoms or something like that. I don't know. Again, I'm talking out my ass here. Um, but they've been modified so that the, these compounds will survive being passed through the liver. Um, cause otherwise the liver will just, you know, detoxify them, break them down and that's where they stop. So they have to be modified to survive a first pass through the liver. And all of that, all that process, um, does introduce some level of liver toxicity that has to be considered. So, um, all oral steroids do this. Even Anivar, super mild, still has some hepatotoxicity to it. Um, every other oral steroid that you take in does as well. So just something to consider there. Strongly limit your use of orals. I would say most people don't ever need to touch an oral. Um, you can't run them for a long time, and therefore they just do less to drive muscle growth overall. So think about this. You're in a growth phase for 26 weeks. If you run Anivar for eight of those weeks, how much is that doing for you? It's not nothing, but also it carries a cost with it. And, uh, that cost is a problem. So the, the thing that's appealing about oral steroids for men and women, both is that clearly because they're oral steroids, they don't have to be injected. That's kind of nice because injecting can suck. A lot of people don't want to do that. Um, but the problem is, um, by injecting things because oral steroids carry all the same potential side effects and risks that injectables do with the additional risk of being toxic to your liver as well. So, um, the correct answer here would be if you're going this route, like you should really focus on a cycle that is based around injectables. This conversation I'm having here is more about for women than anything else. Um, like look at TRT first. And honestly, that may be all that you ever need. Low dose TRT, that's it. You may never need an oral. Keep it simple. Keep it physician monitored. Very, very easy. Very Again, doesn't carry zero risk, but the risk is very manageable and it's limited to things that we have a little bit more direct control over. So, um, orals in general, um, I, I, I would categorize these as things that are really only for the competitive bodybuilder only during their prep phase and only towards the very end of it, like the final two to four weeks. Um, at that point, you know, your, your blood panel is probably going to look like a mess if you're running a cycle anyway. Um, what's the point in making it look more like a mess, you know? And so I've seen cycles from guys where they're doing all of this injectable stuff and then they bring in four different orals at the end. I'm like, what the fuck for? It's not like they all do different things. This is a misconception. A lot of people think like, oh, this one's a hardener. Oh, this one pulls water. No, that's not how they work. There can be some ancillary effects on those, but like the thought that like Winstrol is a hardener, um, it's just, it's, 
th these are tags that we put on it's it's like anthropomorphizing a drug basically and giving it properties that it doesn't have just based on anecdotal evidence that doesn't mean anything you know the thing is like winstrol has a reputation as being a hardener because people take it at the tail end of prep when you're already hard like and and so <laughs> like it, it it does not deserve that reputation that's not what it does there are no h drugs that are hardeners or anything like that there are some that certainly will bring in a lot more water retention which is not a good thing for a lot of reasons um things like nandrolones deca etc will do that um so just by virtue of not doing that you might think that something is a hardener but that's not really how it works so limit the orals. Um, your liver will thank you for it. So um, there are things to consider about dose and compound dependent responses. So the dose of every compound that you take and the selection of those compounds is going to increase or decrease your risk profile. Basically, the more you take and the more things you take, the higher your risk profile is going to be. So for that reason, we always want to try and get the most with the least. And of course, let's not lose sight of the fact that if you take none, that's the best course. <laughs> that is the most healthy course for everybody. Um, you will always be better off health-wise taking nothing unless you have low testosterone. Um, clinically proven and demonstrated low testosterone, which carries a higher risk of all-cause mortality with it. So... Um, that, that's a real thing. That's a real thing. So low testosterone, much like you don't want to suppress estrogen because it's, it's, uh, estrogen has many, um, health benefits as well. Testosterone does as well at physiological amounts. So if you are at sub physiological amounts, you're missing out on those benefits. Um, and so just getting that up into a physiological level will make you a healthier person. So when we go super physiological that we start to run into issues and to be clear, like I've worked with people who take a very low dose of testosterone and see things skewed all over the place in their labs. Um, and that's just genetics. There's nothing that you can do about that. Assuming it is in fact, legit testosterone, like it's from a pharmacy farm provided, not farm grade testosterone. Some people just struggle with that. Um, their body just does not handle it well. And so they have to take a very low dose and it's then them's the breaks. Um, but also for guys, you cannot run a more elaborate cycle without using testosterone as a base. It does not work because anything else that you would introduce will lower your natural testosterone production um, to at the point where now you're taking these compounds, but if testosterone is not one of them, your T is going to be at sub physiological levels and you're going to have a bad time. So it's going to create a whole host of issues, none of which you want anything to do with. So, um, for that reason, um, even guys who do not have a good response to testosterone, like they start to get estrogen skewing, um, they start to have gyno symptoms, their CBC panel starts to look all messed up, even on a low dose of testosterone. If you want to run anything else, um, and you can bring in other compounds that will not skew those as much. Some people are just, you know, hyper, hyper sensitive to some of the negative impacts of testosterone. You still need that testosterone in there. Um, otherwise you're going to have a bad time. So if you use orals, you better have a great reason for it. Um, otherwise, like, oh, I'm going to take some Anivar for four weeks in the off season to help me grow. No, no. If you're going to do that route, go to a clinic, get your blood work done, check your levels, get on TRT if it's appropriate. Um, that That's a, a much better thing to do rather than just, you know, popping orals in your system. It's a pill. It's easy. Yeah, it carries a greater risk with it. Um, and also uh, something to consider is maximize your natural gains first. A lot of people just want to jump straight into gear. It's like, you can make plenty of progress without using any of this stuff. Especially if you're a new lifter, screw that. Just lift, just train, learn how to do it. Um, Cause otherwise what you're going to do is introduce all these compounds into your body while you still don't really know what you're doing. Like you want to have your routine maximized. You want to know what you're doing in the gym. You want to know all this stuff, have that in place and really focus on getting the most that you can out of that routine. And then if you're going to go this route, do it after all that stuff has happened. That's the smart move. Um, use only human approved and fully vetted compounds. So um, I believe the next slide is going to dig into this a little bit more. What are we avoiding? Yes. So when I say fully vetted and human approved compounds, like most of these compounds came about in around like the 1960s is when there was a wide range of these that were introduced. Um, a lot of them for like, you know, cancer treatments and things like that. Um, ma many of them have undergone extensive human testing. Um, most of these are FDA approved. Um, some are not the ones that have undergone little human testing or are not FDA approved. Um, we're, we're going to shy away from those. 
for the most part. So this would be things like boldenone, um, which has a, a severe lack of human testing. SARMs, not to be confused with SERMs. We talked about the selective estrogen receptor modulators. These are selective androgen receptor modulators. These have not been human tested. Um, there's a lack of clinical evidence showing that they do anything. The products are of unknown quality. Um, they are not testable um, through normal means. It's just a big old like, well, roll the dice, hope and a prayer, hope this works. Um, and it's just like, no, there are better options. There are better options. They're still there. Um, you can purchase them legally through a little gray area loophole. You can buy these as research chemicals from sites online. Um, but, uh, the issue there is they're still banned substances. So, uh, if you were taking these, it's not like you can compete in a natural show anyway. So most peptides fall into this category, lack of human testing. It's all anecdotal. Dianabol is one specific oral steroid. We're going to avoid that completely. Most orals or all, all orals in most cases, we're going to avoid. Dianabol is one that I could, I cannot envision a use case scenario for that. So, um, diuretics, so not an anabolic steroid, but something that's often used in conjunction with them, um, for water loss leading into a show. Some people will take them like before a wedding even, or something like that. Just stupid. Now, if you want to take a water pill, um, like MHP expel or something like that, go for it. You're not going to kill yourself doing that. Um, but when you are, uh, when you're introducing prescription diuretics, the thing is the mechanisms of action for these can be very complex. Um, the way that the, the electrolytes are manipulated, is it a potassium sp sparing diuretic or not? Uh, it gets kind of convoluted and a good coach can help you navigate that, but a better coach will tell you that you don't need one. <laughs> so it, they're just, they do not, and this is the one misconception that I would love to get through people's skulls, diuretics in almost all cases make you look worse on stage, not better. Oh, but all the top coaches do this. and that. Yeah, if you get lean enough, it doesn't matter what you do with a diuretic or not. If you're lean enough, then you're lean. And, you know, any water that you pull out, here's the thing. A diuretic does not discriminate between intra and extracellular water. And so it's going to pull intracellular water from the muscle, which means you're going to have less glycogen storage in the muscle, which means you're going to have a hard time getting a pump on stage. Is, is it worth it? You want to show up on stage looking flat but dry? It's a terrible look. It's a terrible look. And the thing is, if you're lean enough, and I mean like, hold on, microphone close to the mouth here. If you are really, really lean enough, it just absolutely doesn't fucking matter at all. And by that, I mean like, oh, I'm lean. Yeah, are you? Uh, I don't know. I still see some there. Still see some there. When you're really lean, it doesn't matter. And if you aren't lean, losing some water doesn't help. <laughs> you're, you're still not lean. So uh, there, there's something I would never recommend them to a client. Uh, I would never, I, I've never, re I've, I have never recommended a client take a diuretic. Um, it's just a non-starter for me. Um, DNP um, is, what's the full name of DNP? I can't remember. Um, it's something really long. It's a supremely toxic fat loss agent, not an anabolic. Um, and I've, I had a client once who wanted to use it. And I said, under no circumstances, no. And he did it anyway, to the point where he bought the raw materials and made the capsules himself. I'm like, dude, this is so dumb. I, I have no part of this at all. Um, that was just so reckless. Uh, so this is one of those things like, no, under no circumstances ever would I recommend, advocate for, or to the extent that I can prevent it, allow the use of DNP. Um, fast insulin. So we haven't really talked about insulin too much here, um, but fast acting insulin, you can get, it gets kind of dangerous with that. A lot of people have this, um, this uh, thought process around insulin as it being kind of like the boogeyman, um, like, oh, nothing's going to kill you faster than insulin will. Well, that's true, but also like if you understand the math and how it works, it's pretty easy to use it effectively. Um, but the question is for bodybuilding purposes, where does the, the use, the appropriate use of this come in? And a lot of people use this, um, under the guise of, well, I'm going to, um, take some insulin so I can get in more carbs. I'm like, it doesn't work that way. Like, you know, whether you're taking insulin or not more carbs than you need is still just going to make you fat. And so that's what usually happens when people take insulin is they just get fat faster. Um, the, what we'd want to do is use insulin as a way to drive blood glucose down if it's getting super, super high due to very high food intake. 
Um, so that's that's the more common use for it. And so Lantus is a very long, it's almost like a basal insulin. Um, so it's just super long release. You take a little bit of that. It's basically your body has a natural insulin production. You're just going to boost that up a little bit to help drive your blood glucose down because blood glucose is one of those things that much like blood pressure, you can monitor it at home and keeping it in a good range. If you keep your blood glucose and your blood pressure in range, I'm not saying you're invincible at that point, but those are two easy things that you can do. And if you keep those in a happy space, you're, you're going to have a better time than somebody who's not monitoring those for sure. So how to keep yourself in check. So regular lab work every 12 to 16 weeks, I would say, um, unless everything looks good and then you could extend that out. If you're not seeing any irregularities when you're on cycle and clearly like some people, they, they are kind of bulletproof on this stuff. Do not assume that that is you. We're making zero assumptions here. You cannot assume like, Oh, I feel fine. Like, you can feel fine and have a CBC that would indicate like, Oh, you're going to die in eight weeks. <laughs> Like if, if it's that bad, like you're at high risk for a stroke here, this is not good. Um, so uh, if everything looks fine though, you can, you can extend that out to every 20 to 24 weeks, especially if you're more of a moderate user. Um, so you want your CBC, your, com your complete blood count done, which contains your hematocrit, your hemoglobin, your lipids, like we talked about liver and kidney markers. Keep in mind that AST and ALT, those are, uh, those are liver enzymes, but also those are enzymes that are also present in skeletal muscle, so they can cross-report there. Um, and the only way to get a really accurate reading on AST and ALT is if you take like three to four days off from the gym prior to going into training. There are other markers that you can get for the liver, um, which would be more accurate, like GGT. Um, C-reactive protein is a good way to, uh, it's just a, a good marker for overall heart health. Your A1C, which is going to be basically like your 90-day average of blood glucose. Um, so a single blood glucose marker can be skewed and doesn't tell us a whole lot. If you monitor it like once a week at home, that can develop some trends and that's good to do. The A1C gives you a much bigger picture um, of the, uh, the, the whole, the whole, gives you a much bigger outlook of the whole picture. Uh, and then a full hormone panel. So this would be testosterone, um, your luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, estrogen, specifically E2 high sensitivity, as we talked about estrogen for women, I would throw in progesterone for men. I would throw in PSA. Um, and if you are uh, gyno prone for men, I would throw in prolactin in there as well. Uh, and then blood pressure and bl blood glucose, which you can do at home clearly as well. So there's a lot of stuff that we can do to, um, to, to keep this stuff kind of above board and an echocardiogram every year, especially for heavier users, I would highly recommend that way, you know, cause the ventricular hypertrophy is one of those things that really, um, cardiac hypertrophy is really, um, one of those things that is, is not really fixable. And so you want to have a good handle on what's happening there, if anything. So, um, Point being, just to take it all back home here, again, not advocating for the use of this stuff. But the thing is, whether I advocate for it or not, whether I tell people not to do it or not, people are going to do it. People are going to use this stuff. And so if, if we implement something that allows for a, a safer use profile overall and just educate you, give you an idea of the kind of things that you want to check so that you can stay ahead of the curve, chances are you're going to have a much more successful career in bodybuilding and you're going to keep your health markers in check so that you're not paying too much of a cost for it over time as well. Hey everybody, I hope you're enjoying this episode. Just wanted to take a quick time out to tell you about a promotion I have going on now for my workout programs at fivestarphysique.com. I have around 50 uh, programs available as of right now. These are comprehensive workout splits for all people, goals, and phases. You can search by volume, general difficulty level, even the number of supersets involved so you don't end up with something that you can't properly execute because your gym is just too damn busy when you go to train. All of these programs do include full video demonstration playlists for each day narrated by yours truly so you know exactly what to focus on and what to watch out for on every move. These are ideal for all skill levels. You can use the promo code DROPSET, one word, at checkout to save 10 bucks on your first program. Link is in the description below or check out 5starphysique.com and click on Workout Programs. Okay. Let's get back to it. All right, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, once again, you can follow this show on Instagram at the drop set podcast. By all means, please uh, leave a message to me there on that account specifically um, and uh, follow the account. You know, you'll get some behind the scenes stuff, posting a little bit of that. And plus all of the show clips, et cetera, that I like to post will be there. Um, but leave a message to that account, um, whether written voice or video, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll do it here. So that's another way to get your questions in. In addition to the call in number 865. 
605-518-6569, which we do have a message today. I do know this is from Grace, who once again is uh, looking to solidify her hold on the title of the drop set MVP. And I don't think she's going to be overthrown, but by all means, somebody feel free to give her some competition. Let's do some more questions here. So I've got this queued up. It's ready to go. Once again, I have not listened to it. Uh, you know how this works. I get the transcript um, via email. I see that uh, enough to like, so I can see who it is. Um, and that's it. So uh, we're going to listen to this, throw some headphones on and play it and see what we got. And I've got my notes app here so I can take some notes on the questions just in case there are a few of them so we'll see what we got here um, I'm looking way over here I gotta click on this it's on the other screen it's way in front of me I think that's it let's see what we got here hey coach it's Grace I've got a couple of what might be dumb questions about a topic today so I'm hoping you won't tease me too too much about it no promises the carnivore diet I was talking to somebody recently who was telling me that he eats 80% protein, 20% fat, no carb sources whatsoever, and that uh, most of her protein comes from red meat. I have a few questions about how all of that works. Uh, first, how does somebody who's eating mostly red meat not worry about their cholesterol levels? Secondly, how do you get somebody on stage without any carb sources? And um, sort of related to that, if somebody is not eating any carbs, how are they getting their fiber and all of the benefits that come with eating fiber? Do they supplement with it? Are they able to do that effectively? I'm just curious about how all of that works. And I think this all lends itself to the bigger question, which is, is there a right way to do the carnivore diet? And are there times when it is suitable and times when it is not? That's all I got for today. Uh, so thank you in advance for tackling this one for me. This is something I have little to no exposure to. So I appreciate you broadening my horizons. Awesome. Well, if nothing else, that's what I'm here to do is broaden horizons. So great question. So carnivore, I have some thoughts on this. Um, and I have, I, I've got plenty of experience with this. I've not done it myself because uh, it seems completely and totally unappealing. The whole lack of carbs thing, that doesn't play with me. I like, I need my carbs. So, um, when, uh, l l let's, uh, I wrote, I wrote some questions here. Let's talk about, first of all, like this is very much a fad diet right now. Um, not all fads are worthless. Um, like keto, I would say is also a fad diet. It has applications. Um, any, any, I can lose these. Hold on. Any, uh, any dietary anything goes through a fad phase. Does that make it a fad diet? Well, at least short-term, yes. And then it kind of lives on, I think, in infamy as that. I don't know if that's coming through. The water is running upstairs. I'm hoping that's not being too intrusive on the audio here. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the issue with carnivore is, well, I mean, there are many right? You have a lot of people who run it because it's a fad diet, which is just the absolute dumbest thing you could do. Just following a diet just because it's the latest thing and other people are doing it is just stupid and nonsensical and not, not a good reason to do anything. Um, for all the reasons that Grace pointed out, like there are a bunch of potential issues with it that should make it a non-starter for most people. Um, there are some people, but the thing is like, it's very, very, very rare for whom it, it can be a reasonable approach. Um, this would be people largely with like, you know, I would say like autoimmune disorder levels of dysfunction in their gut where they just cannot process carbs and cannot process veggies. Um, and it's the thing is like, it's very rare. You will know it. Like if you have, you know, extreme GI distress, if you have like massive skin breakouts when you eat pretty much any carb or any veggie, then you're probably in that category. But also, like, what percentage of people is that? Less than one. <laughs> I mean, much less than one. Not very many people fall into that category. So um, the more prevalent a diet like this becomes, the greater the percentage of people who are following the diet who don't need to. Um, I did have, I, I will spare you the whole story here with this um, client who uh, lasted a day um, before quitting. Um, 
<laughs> this person was coming from a carnivore approach. And I said, hey, would you be open to trying some different uh, different approaches here? Because this is not good. Um, if you don't have a good reason to, then you know it's not really good. And he's like, sure, absolutely. And their their reason for doing it was because they didn't like doing meal prep, which of all the reasons to follow a carnivore diet is probably the most nonsensical one I've ever heard. Because what do I spend all of my time in meal prep doing? It's getting protein sources ready. Carnivore is nothing but protein. So like... So what, you don't want to meal prep carbs? Well, don't. Just eat carbs that are, are I mean, just, that's a completely stupid answer. I, I, you know, I hate to speak in absolutes, but that, that is a dumb reason to follow a carnivore diet. That is a really stupid reason. So there are plenty of stupid reasons to do it. There are a few good ones. And so I do have at present, I think, two clients on my roster who follow a carnivore diet. And for them, uh, one of them came to me saying, this is the approach, this is why, this is why I have to do this, et cetera, and had really figured it out on their own. And um, we have introduced some carbs for a little bit of benefit there, um, but also it's like we noticed that, hey, some of these negative effects are creeping in. We're okay with it to some extent. Um, we want to get the advantage of having some carbs in there, just knowing that we're going to limit that and probably you know start to eliminate those um, as we get deeper into prep too, just because we want to feel better. And the other one was really just kind of like a trial and error. We kind of determined through, over time, like your, your body just does not handle anything other than protein and fats at all. Um, even taking a keto approach and trying to get in some veggies for fiber was, was not working. So we've taken the carnivore approach with, with them as well. So, um, there are rare circumstances where it works. It's just very rare. Would you stop it? Derby's over here barking. Come here, girl. Hi. So yeah. Um, now Grace, to your question, you said carnivore is like 80% protein, 20% fats. Um, uh, that's, that's pretty heavily skewed towards protein. Um, I also fear that like a lot of this comes from like protein is anabolic. You need protein to build muscles. So let's eat nothing but protein, which is the dumbest bullshit ever. I don't know if that's uh, that plays into a lot of the rationale behind why some people would do this. But if so, that would be incredibly stupid. Like there's only so much protein you can handle. Um, a lot of people will just run into massive GI problems when they go overboard on protein. Not everybody. Clearly, if you are a person who can only handle so much protein and you can't handle carbs um, at all, carbs or veggies, like we're going to have an issue. There. This is going to be like a very moderate protein, super, super high fat diet, which can pose some other issues as well. So you have no carbs, no fruits, no veggies, basically none of the stuff that's good for you, all the stuff that has the reputation of being more bad for you than anything else, which I would contend is not really the case. But um, it's kind of, uh, I would call it as much carnivore, I'd also call it the contrarian diet. <laughs> So, um, yeah. How do you not have to worry about lipids? Well, you do. Absolutely. Especially if a lot of your, uh, a lot of your proteins are coming from saturated fats, um, then absolutely you should worry about lipids. Yes. Now that being said, like we talked about in the first segment here about, um, the impact of PEDs on lipids, some people are just more bulletproof than others. Like if you've got great lipid panels to begin with, um, it's entirely possible that you could employ a diet like this and still have great lipid panels. But if you don't, that's a good indicator that maybe this is not the diet for you. Um, also, um, what, one other thing that impacts your lipids is your fiber intake, you know, a mix of soluble and insoluble fiber with no carbs, you're getting no fiber intake. So again, how does that work? Well, fiber is a very personal thing as well. And some people get by with no fiber intake. Um, I would not say it's super common, but, um, again, the, the, the trap that you can fall into here where you paint yourself into a corner is if you have determined that the carnivore diet is the best one for you through, let's call it like, you know, we've, we've discovered that this seems like a fairly legitimate answer. Um, but your GI doesn't handle protein well. Uh, like you, you're limited to like one gram per pound of body weight because on a carnivore diet, you could very easily get into two grams per pound of body weight um, on protein um, just to hit your caloric needs, right? Um, and then what if, well, in getting these fats in, my lipids skew, and then without fiber, my, I'm just in a state of constant constipation. That'd be a great band name, by the way, constant constipation. Um, then like, yeah, uh, then this is not the answer for you. And we need, we need to find some other kind of approach. Maybe it's keto. I don't know. Um, it just depends on the person. I have not encountered anybody for where all of those things, all those confluence of factors have come to a head. So um, if they did, how would we troubleshoot it? One step at a time, as always. But yeah, the lack of fiber is a concern. Um, the lipids are a concern as well, absolutely. As far as how to get on stage without carbs, not a big deal. Um, you know, just because you can, you can, 
you can, you can fill out just on proteins and fats. You can, um, it's what we need are calories. So you're going to be, um, you, you, what you don't get are the option to fill out on, um, things that are going to just directly convert into glycogen and are going to get you more full. Um, but you know, there are plenty of competitors out there who have followed keto based plans and even in peak week stick with a keto based, um, you know, I won't say carb up, but a keto based fill up, um, just, you know, amplifying their protein intake and their fat intake. Is it optimal? Not for most people, but is it doable for sure? Yeah. So what's the right way to do it? Well, the right way to do it is to probably not do it <laughs> unless you absolutely have to. If you don't absolutely have to, I can guarantee you it is not the best approach. Um, and I hate to be a hardliner on that, but the thing is, like, you know, there, there are health concerns with it, um, which, again, are, are kind of blanket concerns. And some people might find, might find themselves immune to that. Like, if your lipids handle a diet like this, well, great. Like we talked about in the last segment, though, don't make the assumption that they will. That's not smart. Um, and the lack of fiber is an issue. Also, just, you know, you're, you're lacking any food-based, you know, micronutrients, vitamins and minerals. I mean, you get some from all the proteins. Um, but still it's going to leave giant gaps in your nutrients. Um, so it's, it's very possible that you could become nutrient deficient. Um, in general, I think that the big picture blanket answer would be any, any dietary protocol that you follow that restricts entire food groups or entire categories of food is probably flawed in its design in some way. Um, I think realistically, the only things that you should avoid when it comes to foods are things that make you feel like crap. And so for a very small percentage of the population, that might put you in a carnivore type space. Um, but again, it's such a small percentage of the population that um, clearly there are far too many people running this right now. Some of it comes down to preference. Like if you prefer to do this and your health markers don't get skewed, that's fine. It's still not the best approach. I'm going to encourage you to try something different <clears throat> just because a lot of people might prefer it for the wrong reasons. Um, like I prefer it because it's easier. Okay. Well not doing this is, can also be easy. So <laughs> I mean, it, the more restrictive you get, the harder a diet is to follow in the long term. So that's, that's my take home point there. So yeah, great question, Grace coming from somebody who is vegan. Also, it probably feels like, uh, you know, like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> like, I, I do not, it's like the, the anti-vegan diet. So, um, or like I said, the contrarian diet is what it is. Let's take all the stuff that we typically think is healthy, like whole grains, you know, uh, complete proteins, but in modest amounts, fruits, veggies, etc. Let's just do it the opposite. It's like all protein, loads of saturated fats, no fruits, no veggies, no fiber. It's like, Why? Why? Unless there's a demonstrated need for it due to extreme circumstances, it's just not the best approach. So there we go. Keep the questions coming. Uh, again, 865-518-6569 is the number. At the Drop Set Podcast on Instagram. Leave a message there, either written, video, or audio. Love to hear it all. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, next week's schedule will be a little weird. So I'm traveling next week. I'm going to have. Uh, I'm gonna try and get an episode in the tank so that it will post on Friday. Um, I will be traveling. I'll be in Oregon by the time Friday rolls around. I don't know what it's going to look like yet, but uh, we'll, we'll plan for that later. So, um, But we should keep things rolling through my little break here. Uh, and that's, that's about it. So uh, that's all I got. If you're, if you're watching on YouTube, thank you. I appreciate it. Give the video a like, um, subscribe to the channel. If you feel like I've earned it, leave a comment. You can leave your questions there as well. I'd love to get those. Um, and if you're listening online, thank you very much. If you're listening to the audio only version online, once again, iTunes listeners, special request. If you can go and leave a rating and a review because the, uh, the library of those did get reset. So this podcast is eight years old and at last check it had one star rating and no reviews. So, um, that's a problem. That was my mistake. I, I messed something up. Uh, it's a long story involving the, uh, the convoluted history of my Apple ID and how it gets tied to this podcast. So, um, it's, uh, it's so boring. I don't even want to think about it. So I know nobody here wants to listen to it either. So anyway, if you could, if you're listening on uh, Apple podcast, please go and leave a review and a rating there. I'd much appreciate it. I'll catch you all next week. In the meantime, be good, stay safe, train hard, and I'll catch you back here then.
Okay, that wraps up another episode, and thank you all so much for watching. If you like this episode, please share it on social media and tag me on Instagram. I am at Darren underscore star. Also, please subscribe to the channel here if you haven't already, and feel free to check out any of those other videos that you see here as well. FiveStarPhysique.com has details on everything that I have to offer, including contest prep coaching, body transformation coaching, workout programs, swag, and a whole lot more. Thanks again for listening, and I will catch you all back here next week.